Good evening, everyone. I, I hope you all enjoyed the first full day of uh, this year's Pathways Conference. We've got a few more of those yet to go. And thank you for joining us for dinner. Um, you know, two years ago, it is almost about this time, uh, I was taking a trip to King Salmon, Alaska, to engage in a what else, salmon fishing. And my outfitter, uh, on the agenda that my outfitter put together, there was a, a short, well, it looked like a short air, airplane ride over to Katmai National Park to see Brook Falls. Now, I didn't, I mean, I was a little bit familiar with it vaguely, but, in, but, but I didn't uh, know very much about it. So, you know, upon arrival in, in the float plane, uh, uh, we had a little bit of training by the National Park Service staff. And then, then we were on our own and we could walk up to the platform um, where you, you, where the falls is. You have to wait a little bit before, you know, to, so they don't overcrowd the, the, the uh, platform. Um, but after, you know, a, a short wait, we were, we were on the platform and the fish were just jumping everywhere up over the falls and it wasn't a bear in sight. So I'm like, I gave up fishing for this. <laughs> so, so, um, we started, the colleague I was with started to, to walk down the trail. We thought maybe if we go down lower on the river or something, we could maybe able to see a bear. And um, we're walking down the trail and all of a sudden <laughs> there was like this amazing racket of breaking branches and grunting coming like fast up upon us and behind us. And, and the first thing that you think of in that moment is, what did the ranger tell, tell me to do? Like, what's the training? I can't remember what I was supposed to do, but it's pretty instinctive. You get off the trail because these bears are coming at you. So these two bears were like plowing toward us. Like, and, and you kind of go like, oh, this is it. And they stopped short of us. And um, they started to wrestle with one another. And you got you must be in your mind right now going, I wonder what that looked like. That's what it looked like. I took the picture and I swear that bear that's looking at you right now was looking at me saying, after I'm done with him, it's going to be you. So my, my brief experience at Brooks had a real, anyone that knows me knows how trans, what a transformative effect that had on me. And the more I, I learned about the management, I, our next guest is the manager and I called him and kept him on the phone forever. And he was so nice to talk to me. But the more I learned about the management of that place, the more impressed that, that I was. They have such an amazing constituency and such an amazing management model. Uh, and, and here in the lower 48, we need more of, of the kinds of things that this is about and how it inspires people when they go in and see what you see there and experience uh, what you experience there. So, so when we were doing this conference, like on mutualism, th th the first person that I called was Mark Sturm and asked him if he would come and talk because this is such an, an amazingly inspirational uh, arrangement that we have up there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark so he can share with you what's involved with that. Um, but let me first tell you that he's a career natural resource manager in the National Park Service. He is now the superintendent of Katmai National Park Preserve, Park and Preserve. And you know, prior to, the, he's familiar to us here because prior to that he was the biological resource program manager for the National Park Service Intermountain Region. So he got involved in projects with like high profile species like bears and wolves and bison and elk and bighorn sheep. Um, he also has previous work uh, that include oversight of natural resource or resource management at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona. Would you please welcome Mark Sturm? I've been looking forward to his talk for two years. Thanks. 
potential. Okay. Is there any trick to using this? I'll figure it out. Yeah, I got it. Kamai, Kayana Sirinak. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for uh, the privilege of speaking with you today. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park and Preserve. And uh, it's, uh, it's a unique place that I've come to know and love over the past several years. I got to tell you before I dig into my talk, though, that uh, this is like everybody in town where I live showing up to hear what I got to say. So it's a pretty remarkable thing. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, what you do in the field of conservation. You know, I, I, uh, I agreed in part to come and talk about uh, our experience and our, our, what we do at, at Brooks Camp, but also in, in part because this whole field of, uh, of the concept of mutualism and another way of, of, of conducting and considering conservation work has, has developed and evolved significantly, obviously, uh, since certainly I was an undergrad student and a graduate student. So uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, but I'm here to learn too, and I've learned a lot already, and uh, I look forward to uh, learning more over the next couple of days. So let's see, how do I get this slideshow started? Where do I point? That looks like it. I'm with you. Thank you, sir. Can I just ask? I'm a little bit tall. Can you all hear me okay? The mic is coming off loud in the back. Okay, good deal. So uh, the title of my talk is uh, Working with Bears as Emissaries for the Natural World, A Glimpse into Brooks Camp Operations. Uh, before I... Uh, I, I move any further into my talk, I wanted to just take a moment and acknowledge that Katmai National Park occurs uh, on the ancestral lands of the Alutic Supiat people uh, and the Yukuk people and the Dena'ina people uh, on the Alaska Peninsula. On this slide, the Dena'ina, this is a language slide, it's the closest slide I could come, but actually those Dena'ina folks came on down and, and certainly occupied certain areas uh, down and into Katmai National Park and Preserve. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, that the privilege it is uh, to to work on their ancestral lands and uh, to work with them uh, on 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 co-management issues and on uh, environmental justice issues and and other things that we're we're engaged in up there. Uh, I don't go into too much detail on that, but uh, if you're interested in some of what we might be inter in, involved in with regard to that kind of work, uh, please come and find me and talk to me about it. So uh, I thought I'd start big and uh, and then then shrink it down and get down to to the Brooks Camp situation, um, but uh, you know the Brooks Camp uh, itself comes together. It's a pretty famous world destination for for bear viewing and, and angling, um, and uh, it's a remarkable place. But it's also the the Bristol Bay region, which is essentially, uh, if you look at the the map of Alaska, the bay that's just above the Alaska Peninsula, just jutting out into the North Pacific is the Bristol Bay. And uh, the, the, the sockeye salmon run that runs up that is phenomenal. And it has been for a long, long time. And it's a testament to a lot of the fisheries managers that, uh, that, that developed the science for salmon fishery management in large part, or at least, at least for sockeye uh, in, in, in Katmai and in surrounding, surrounding watershed areas. Uh, and the fishery is uh, remarkably strong. They set the highest record last year uh, ever for, for returning migration. Uh, and that was just after having set the record the previous year. So um, the whole system depends on this, this migration. But I guess uh, it's not all good news up, up where we're at. Uh, there is a, uh, there's, a, there's a number of fisheries that have been uh, collapsing uh, around us. And so we're, we're paying attention and we're a little bit concerned. We're setting records uh, with both uh, number of returned and escapement and also with uh, harvest, commercial harvest uh, fish. And at the same time, uh, you know, two watersheds over, the Yukon is collapsing. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the fisheries in, in, in particular are certainly being affected at a scale that's much larger than, uh, 
than than the the lands that we manage. It's something to be concerned about. And I guess I just wanted to take a few uh, a, a couple of slides just to show some of the things that we're, we are concerned about. Uh, the level of uh, the level of commercial harvest uh, in the fishery uh, this, the, and across across all of the species of salmon that are that occur in the Pacific and certainly in our part of, of Alaska have been diminishing in size a little bit, and that has uh, fecundity implications and uh, productivity implications, uh, equals ecological services implications. Uh, these are all a little bit in decline. Uh, it's not too bad in, in in the area where we're at. Again, we're setting records with numbers of fish. Um, and there is some some research that's showing that the reason why the the decline in size of some of some of our more abundant fish is because of the competition for food. Like there's so many of them, they can't grow as big, kind of a thing. So, um, but there's also a concern for like what the implications of this are long term ecologically. Um, there's things that have happened in the recent past that are also of concern, and, and things that are that are happening uh, at least at certain stages that we're also focused on. The picture on the I guess your left, if you're looking at the screen, uh, is, is, is an image from 2014, 2015, 2016. This phenomena, which was essentially uh, what, what, what we, at least uh, up, up in my neck of the woods, called the, the Pacific, the North Pacific blob, was a, was a, a body of hot water that stayed for years and, and, and took a while to dissipate and, and had uh, you know, a, a significant amount of effects. It, it, it created... Um, some uh, algal blooms. It it, it facilitated uh, a, a, a different uh, community of organisms, uh, the plankton and, and such. You know, when the warmer water is is what's predominates what, what what predominates, the uh, the uh, the potential for things like red tides is dramatically increased, and those those kinds of things. And also, uh, the the uh, the salmon are a cold cold water species. They they depend upon cold water to uh, to be. Uh, to, to su sustain their growth and sustain their population. Um, it's also important to understand that cold water systems in, in this part of the world are more productive than warm water systems. The slide on the on the, the image on the on the right uh, is, a, is an image about uh, the implications of, of uh, ocean acidification, uh, which, uh, which has uh, uh, which, which, which is increasing with the uh, deposition of carbon in the in the atmosphere into the oceans it has a it has an effect on the zo zoonotic plankton that that uh, that occur in, in all over the world and in particular here it's a it's a, one of the primary food resources for for uh, salmon in particular and especially during their developmental stages in the ocean and uh, the f the fact that uh, calcification process is interrupted uh, for the zoonotic plankton by increased acidification is, is certainly a cause for concern. Uh, things that we just need to be aware of and understand and, and try to raise awareness about. Uh, let me go back here a second. I wanted to next take you to Katmai, uh, just to give you a little bit of an orientation. Most people probably know, but just to make sure, uh, Katmai National Park is down on the, the elbow of the, of the uh, Alaska Peninsula. It's about 300 miles flight from Anchorage, uh, which is in the image of Alaska, the, the, the mainland Alaska area. Katmai uh, is the image on the right. It's a four million acre park. It's a it's a it's a privilege to work in such a large landscape. It is uh, largely pristine. We have a total of thirty miles of roads for for all that all that land area, which is not much. I mean, that's not much. Uh, although the the roads are a, a, a complicated thing, and we're, we're you'll see a slide. I'll tell you. I'll show you why it's a complicated thing. Um, but it's important to understand that to to access Katmai National Park. You can't drive there to get to uh, Katmai from Anchorage. You got to take a flight. Um, I guess there are some people that come all the way around the peninsula and, and get up into Nack Nack on, on barges and, and, and cruise, cruise ships, not cruise ships, but uh, other types of private vessels and such. Um, but you got to get there uh, either, either by taking a commercial flight. And then when you get to, to King Salmon, you got to still get into the park. And the primary means of accessing the park is over water or, or, or by air. So it's a unique and challenging thing. It's not easy to get to, and you gotta wanna go there to, uh, to show up. Um, I'll show you a little bit of an image, but if you look at the image of Katmai uh, in, the, uh, in the lower, in, in the middle left area, there's kind of four, four black squares and a green square underneath it. That's the location of Brooks Camp where we're gonna be uh, spending most of this talk uh, discussing. So, and that's, that's kind of at the, uh, 
the juncture or the, the isthmus between Brooks Lake, which is the lake to the left of you or the west on the image and and neck neck lake which is the larger lake uh that's uh that's to the north and east of, of where that that location is before uh I, I go any further i wanted to take a minute and just to share a couple of things about myself this is a, a an image of me in a younger thinner version uh with my daughter's soul uh she uh she, she's she and i are on a horseback on a ranch where we uh where we did some, uh, well, I did the research. She wasn't helping much there at the time, but uh, we had some fun down there while we were there. This is in Uruguay, South America, and the diminutive uh, deer species in the image is, uh, is the pampas deer, Ossotocirus bezoarticus. It was, uh, back before colonialization, the dominant ungulate in South America uh, by biomass and, and by abundance. It, it predominated in open grassland habitat. It prefers it. I, I was down there trying to understand why it was selecting for uh, certain habitats and not others that appeared to be similar uh, and came to find came to understand that uh, that this deer species liked the good stuff you know it liked their high quality forage and once you once you altered the composition in that rangeland so much uh, it, it tended to try to move on and find that high quality forage at the abundances it was looking for someplace else um, and so Managing for this species in particular was something that we advocated for with the partners I was working with at the time. Uh, and, and doing so, in, it, it, it increased your productivity, it increased your high quality forage in your pastures. It, it, it also enabled your pastures to withstand, withstand extended periods of drought for, for longer times. And it was also better, better positioned your, your, your pastures for uh, recovery once a drought would end. So a lot of reasons why a simple thing like trying to make sure that you had habitat that would sustain this guy, which is an endangered species in many parts of its historical range, um, well, was was in the, was, was in your financial interest. That was a lesson to me. But I guess I just wanted to say that my background is in ungulate management primarily, and in, in understanding kind of the the role of ungulates in uh, uh, and and how they influence the habitats that they depend upon. And so the Park Service in its uh, infinite wisdom, you know, said, Mark, you know, you spent 20 years learning how to manage ungulates and stuff. Let's uh, let's send you up there to Katmai to figure out what's going on with bears, or at least help those folks manage those bears. And who knew? I mean, who knew that, that they uh, they focus on these, their grazers? And I, I guess I share this. This is on the Katmai coast. Uh, bears come out uh, in, in abundance. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable landscape to see. It's different, Mike, than what you experienced at Brooks Camp. If you haven't been to the coast, you need to go next time you're there. Uh, the animals are different and they behave differently. We treat them differently than what you're going to see about the Brooks Camp. But the reason I share this slide is because it's important to understand uh, Alaska brown bears are omnivorous. They're adaptable. They 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 will find a way uh, to to do in, in in light of change. And I think that we can all agree that change is 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 one of the things that we're we're all going to be experiencing for some time to come. Um, but they uh, they they can do well if they just have a chance. And they need to have the space to have the chance. So uh, back to Brooks Camp. This is the beach on Knack Knack Lake. Uh, as you arrive, you have just uh, taken your flight either from Homer or Anchorage or Kodiak or King Salmon or wherever you originated from. Uh, and you have arrived on the lake at the beach of Knack Knack Lake. The primary means of access, as I said, uh, is, is float plane access, um, which is unique. Uh, in, in my experience in the park service, I, I know that there's other places that do it, but as the primary means of access, it's, 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 it's a unique thing. Uh, and it takes a certain level of cooperation and, and uh, a, a level of coordination among operators and the park service to, to make this work. Um, you know, they leave their planes on the beach and somebody's got to keep the bears off of the planes. And so that's up to us to do. Um, but uh, it's kind of a phenomenon uh, that's uh, unique and, and, and right away you're, you're struck by you're in a different kind of a place when you arrive. So you arrive at Brooks Camp. This is the sign right in front of the visitor center. And as Mike was describing, the first thing we ask you to do is to come, at, come to the visitor center and go through what we call a bear orientation. We have a little film. We try to hit the high, high points, you know, don't run, you know, don't approach a bear within 50 yards. Uh, keep your stuff with you. Don't put it down outside of arm's reach kind of stuff. Keep, you know, put your food in the caches that we have and that sort of stuff. So we, we hit all those points. And then we, you know, 20 minutes later, we, a ranger will come in and, and, and talk with you about here's where you're at. Here's where you need to go. Here's what, you know, where you're, what are you here to see? And the campground's over here. The, 
the falls are over there kind of thing and get you oriented to the location. And then we kick you out the door and you're all trained up and you know how to behave yourself in bear country. And uh, so uh, this is an image of, of where, uh, where Brooks Camp is. It's just a little bit zoomed in. I, I mentioned before the Brooks Lake side of things, which is to the, to the west and the, the Naknek Lake side of things is to the east. Depending on how the wind blows, operations change. So we have to be able to adjust where we go to, to receive visitors and, and how we receive them, depending on what the weather's doing on any particular day. Um, the system is, uh, is, as you can see, there's a little trail system. There's a, there's a map that shows you uh, the lake, the, the map that goes along uh, Naknek Lake there. The, the trail that goes along Naknek Lake will take you up to Dumpling Mountain and to the campground. And if you want to come, uh, come over to the falls, you have to, you have to uh, come across the river and then get on the service road for the part that the Park Service uses and then walk out the trail system. And so just to give you a moment to kind of get oriented to what the place looks like. So you come out of your bear orientation and you're a little bit wiser than when you were when you when you landed and you uh, you start looking around maybe a little closer than than uh, than you did and you start wondering maybe to yourself who's really in charge here and do, do these people know what they're doing and maybe we should have gone to the beach instead uh bears are are uh Bears are, are a headache. I mean, they, they, they come with some baggage, um, but we've, mo we've worked most of our stuff out with them. And uh, this is a unique thing. These cottonwoods with, that, that have been uh, uh, girdled and skinned, uh, there was one bear that just learned how to uh, kind of peel the back of the bark and go after the, uh, go after the cambium layer underneath uh, about three or four years ago. And all of a sudden, almost all of our cottonwoods in camp are skinned and stuff. And thankfully they stopped because we were losing a lot of our shade. And we're still trying to figure out what the long-term plan for getting that shade back is, but uh, we have tried to save the the, the, the few cottonwoods that, that that are remaining. It happened fast. We we weren't ready for it, and and it took us a little while to get organized, but we're at least we got some techniques to stop it. Uh, same thing with cabins. Uh, they they chew on stuff. They certainly tear stuff apart. There's a week or two, excuse me, a month or two at the end of the season where we have turned off our water and, 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 and bolted up all of our doors and the bears are still kind of poking around out there and the places to themselves. So all of a sudden we've been keeping them out of camp all summer long. And now there's nobody around to keep them out of camp and they kind of make themselves at home a little bit. But if you start, if you come, uh, come to Katmai, you'll notice that we have done some things uh, just to keep, uh, keep it real and keep it, uh, keep it a, a reasonable thing to do a proposition to come and camp in, in an area that's populated by such an abundant bear population. Uh, we have a campground. It's the only one for 300 miles in any direction, uh, and it's it's a fine place to camp. Uh, very popular. It sells out in seconds when it goes live on on rec.gov. Um, you'll see we have a, a electric fence around it. You'll see we have uh, some some caches and for gear and and food and such and a, a faucet that you can you know it's the only place you got to keep clean, clean your stuff. So there's we're real sticklers about you got to do it the way we're telling you to do it, folks. Because if we didn't. It wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. So other things that we have is a place for people that are here for a day trip. They can picnic uh, inside electric fence. You got to eat inside electric fence. We have hard sided buildings. We ha have hard sided buildings where our lodge provides food service. It's the best hundred best sale for three hundred miles in any direction too. By the way, when you go, and uh, and if you if you look closely at the the uh, the guest cabin that's in the bottom picture. On the right, uh, you'll see that there's some angle irons on on the the the, the little wooden uh, fence wall that's sticking out there, and that's to keep the bears from chewing on. So we do what we can to protect our our assets and keep the bears from chewing on things. And there's a lot of those little tricks that we've we figured out over the years, mostly because a bear made us figure it out. Um, we also have you'll notice uh, some of my staff uh, walking around camp and. Uh, we don't necessarily haze bears or, or push them away from uh, from where they want to go. We let them go 99% of the time where they want to go. We do try to keep bears uh, uh, aware of the fact that we don't want them near where we got a lot of people. And so we try to keep them uh, moving along or out of the out of the lodge area, which is a very small uh, portion of the of the overall uh, of the overall footprint of the area where, where Brooks Camp occurs. Um, I can tell you right now, this is Nick, uh, Nick's hazing this, uh, the, this family off. You can see the sows looking and, and checking out what the cubs doing. I can tell you, Nick and, 
and this this cub that cub's probably three years old this year and, and they're probably going to have a few run-ins because his attitude is not the right attitude we like to see uh, but the sow is cooperating right and so this sow uh, raised these cubs raised them raised that those cubs in and among us they kind of know what the routine is they try to instill that behavior in their 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 young and we know what the routine is we kind of have all agreed on what the lines are and we try as much as possible to do our own thing and leave each other alone but we do need to talk to each other once in a while and this is how we do that uh just a, a quick slide about the overall operations again this is a, a lodge uh, with a lot of park service housing and other infrastructure uh, out in the middle of a park on a peninsula that you can't drive to and so it's a complicated thing to have a place like this out there I just wanted to highlight a few things. One thing that we're doing administratively is the lodge was built at a different in a different time, uh, and and at a different time when when the uh, priorities of the agency and the priorities of the people, uh, the the the, the uh, society were were different than what they are now. It's actually built on top of an archaeological resource that is is at least in, according to today's filter of looking at how things should be done, uh, disrespectful. And we need to do something about that. We need to recognize that this, this should not have been built where it is. And, and uh, how, do we, how do we make that right? You know, th this, these lands were occupied for thousands and thousands of years by Alaska Native peoples. Um, and, uh, and essentially what the Park Service uh, has, has tried to do is at least identify opportunities to remove some of its infrastructure. The, the image on the, the, uh, the right-hand side is, is where we've constructed uh, a, a little bit of a loop road where we've got some housing and a, and a facility, a maintenance facility. You'll notice in the image in the middle, I know this is a busy image and I was I was hoping to have a little bit of a pointer to kind of explain it a little bit better, but the blowouts are then blown out again is kind of how to look at it. The thing that you should take note of is where, where the current lodge infrastructure is, which is in the top images, uh, is right on the lake down to the river. And where we're trying to build the additional infrastructure now is well away from the lake and well away from the river in an area that wasn't inhabited by by uh, Alaska Native peoples for so, such a long time. There's no cultural sensitivities that we know of in this area. And so we're trying as we are able to get the money to move our assets and operate differently. We're in an interim phase right now. And so we have a uh, we have essentially two different ge power generation systems, one on the north side of the river and one on the south side of the river. So it's very inefficient. If there's a light bulb anywhere on, uh, at, at Brooks Camp, there's a generator running somewhere to power that light bulb. And so this year, we're actually going to be connecting up, taking off that north side situation and, and operating uh, the entire camp because we've hooked, put all the, all the, all the, the uh, electric wires in place and we can hook it all up. And so we're going to have one generator system. We're going to have solar power augmented. We have some solar. We're going to do more. And we're also going to have battery packs so we can run our generators, one generator, power those batteries as much as we can, turn off the generator and run the whole camp on batteries power. It's gonna save a ton of fuel. You know, we worry about our carbon footprint and how we run the camp. Uh, it'll save on our, my, my employees time to deliver all that material out there. It'll save hassles with bears uh, and, and the potential impacts that we could have with an accident with bears carrying such large amounts of fuel across a beautiful lake like the Knack-Knack Lake. And uh, it'll also save us a lot of money, taxpayer money, your money. Uh, just uh, by uh, by not having to buy so much fuel and, and running the place on batteries. So we're trying to do what we can as fast as we can. It's not it's not always easy. And the last thing I can I want to mention on this graph is uh, we turned on. Uh, people probably know uh, the uh, the webcams uh, for the bears at, at the falls, and and people found Katmai, and they've been coming ever since. Our visitation has has, has more than doubled in the past decade. Uh, like so many other parks around the country and other conservation areas, it's not a unique problem, uh, but it certainly is challenging the infrastructure we have. The, the infrastructure that you've seen in some of these images uh, was built to accommodate less than half of the types the, the, the level of visitation we currently have. So we're going to start a visitor use management plan and talk about what's reasonable and good. We need to make sure we're preserving, first and foremost, the, the, the Alaska brown bear. It's in our mission. It's what, what we do and why we do things. And we also... Uh, we also need to make sure that we're focused on maintaining a high quality visitor experience. And uh, how many how many guests can we reasonably accommodate when everybody needs to go to the same spot? It's gonna be a complicated and controversial uh, planning process, uh, but we're gonna start it next year. Uh, and we welcome anyone that has an opinion or would like to uh, to, to dig deep into the issues that, that are involved in that decision, but it's something that's necessary given the times that we're in. 
Another thing that's a consequence of increased vegetation, we have a new wastewater treatment facility. It's a good thing. We need this thing. It's the first time ever that Katmai National Park has been in full compliance with the way things should be done in today's, in today's world with monitoring, uh, managing human waste. Something that we just uh, had to focus on. Designing something like that in bear country is tricky. I'll tell you that much. And uh, we, we, we put a few uh, precautionary things in place to keep the bears out and, and to also uh, keep it in an area where, where bears don't frequent nearly as much. So it's, uh, it's a great thing that we're gonna have and it's, it's long overdue. Oh, that'll be completed. The construction of that will be completed at wastewater treatment plant this year. Uh, the next image, you know, you've come out of your, uh, your, your visitor center, you got your camp set up, you're walking across the bridge that Mike was talking about. And the picture on, on your left is the picture of the floating bridge we used to have. And we got bear jammed on that thing every day for hours at a time. And so essentially the rule is you can't approach a bear within 50 yards. So uh, if there's a bear within 50 yards of that bridge, nobody's crossing the bridge. That was a problem for some people who came from all over the world to go to the falls. And the only thing stopping them was a bear sleeping 25 yards away from the bridge. Uh, it's a, it's, it was a situation. Uh, we built this elevated bridge and boardwalk in 20, uh, the summer of 2018, 2019. Uh, it, it's a remarkable thing. It has greatly facilitated the movement of people and, and to include my staff, myself, you know, before we were jammed just like everybody else. Now uh, we got options and uh, the, the, the flow of people and the ability before when a bear was sleeping like this, we would have the, the guests and, and ourselves back in the woods where you couldn't see what was going on. And only one person out there kind of monitoring what the bear was doing. Now people are up on top of the bridge and they get to see everything. And, and because they're on a, an approved platform, they can, they can observe the bears in their natural habitats. The bears have acclimated to this new thing. And matter of fact, it didn't take them too long. Um, but at the other end of it, and when you get on the south side, we dump you out on our service road and you're still there with the bears. You better keep your eyes open. So this has really been a, a game changer for us. It also is, uh, in, under the right conditions, the place to be to go see bears. I mean, the bears are more down in the lower river than they are up at the falls, uh, just because of the, the conditions that they have for fishing salmon out of the river. Low water, low water years, this is where you want to be to watch bears. But you're on your way to the falls. And you better keep your eyes peeled because there's bears around and you will see stuff like this and you will get in, in proximity to them. And it's a really unique situation when you're on the ground, especially if you, my first time, I was like, oh, this is nuts. We don't, I mean, this is how we're managing bears in this park. Uh, it was, it, it took me a while and uh, it probably takes most people a while. But uh, once you've, once you've been there a while and you kind of understand that these bears are, are they grew up in the, in the neighborhood, they kind of know the deal and they're well fed. They are well-fed animals. They got an abundance of food. It's a remarkable thing to see. It's a remarkable thing to experience. And uh, they just got, they don't have anything to do with us. They just, they just kind of let us do our thing. As long as we kind of stay where we're supposed to be, uh, everything works out just fine. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're hopeful that that's the case. I can tell you this, uh, with that increased visitation that we've been experiencing in recent years, the opportunity for those human wildlife conflicts have, have every, every additional person is just one more chance that something's going to happen. We have documented in the past five years, four human bear contacts. I'm not saying close proximity I'm saying people touching bears four times. That's a bad deal. It's going to go South fast. And uh, I guess I would, I just say it had never been documented in the previous 25 years that there were, there were records that we could look up. Uh, and we have started to see, and that's an indication to me that we're just, people are just a little bit too comfortable with the situation. And so we're trying to tune into that and see what we need to do about it. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, that we get that figured out uh, before before something bad happens. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the, the area where, where Mike said you get to, we have a, a observation overlook. You can, uh, you can see bears at the falls. Everybody comes, they wanna go to the same location. We have a place to manage kind of the mass rush of people. There's kind of a pattern to the day. People show up in the morning. Uh, there's, there are people that are staying at the lodge. They're staying in the campground. And, uh, and then people start showing up on, on watercraft uh, and, on, and, on, and on, uh, float planes. And, uh, there's a big crush of people in the morning starting around nine o'clock and it's kind of pitters down sometime around 11 or 12 uh, and people are still there. They all have their lunch and they stay till five or six and then they go on and then the evening is kind of a slowed down version of that. So uh, depending on the time of day, you have you have different types of experiences, but when the big crush is on, we need to kind of manage 
the number of people that go out onto the platforms. Um, but they 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 have the view when the show is on. It's a spectacular thing, as you'll see in a slide or two coming up. Um, but uh, the uh, in the interim, we have to kind of manage. We have multiple staff that kind of check in and make receive people. We literally give them a restaurant. You know, here's your here's your buzzer. When it goes off, come back. You can go out. That's that's the kind of thing. And we have the uh, the solar panels there to help run both that system and and also the cameras that that project those images all around the world. So I mentioned these webcams, we, we turned these things on. It has been a remarkable experience and it has caused us uh, a few, uh, a, a, you know, to learn a few things. Uh, the, the world fell in love with, with the, the Brooks Camp Bears uh, and uh, certainly they, they, they make themselves known. Uh, the, the first version of the webcams came on about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, as, as of this point, we have our good friends at explore.org. Uh, we could not do this without them. To get the signals and imagery out of there on the webcams is a remarkable thing that the National Park Service uh, could not pull off on its own. We had to have someone with deep pockets. I'm not sure what that was. Uh, that, that could help us get that work done and with capable people. And they'd come out and they can't help us maintain this, this, uh, this infrastructure. And it's been a, a remarkable opportunity for us as managers to kind of message to a much broader audience the importance of Katmai as, as a conservation area and as, as a spe spectacular destination and, and what it represents with regard to uh, the, the ecological health of the region and, and the broader, uh, broader areas in, in the North Pacific. So the other thing I guess I, I, I wanted to mention is uh, we have staff that look for and, and identify our, our sub-adult and adult bears uh, they do it every year. Uh, we have a long-standing study trying to understand uh, individuals and their their life histories, how they interrelate with each other, how they behave among each other, um, and we share this information. It, it's published every year. It's it's a big thing. The day that the park lets lets this book out, essentially, it's the updated imagery of the different individuals. It's kind of like you're reading the obituary page: who died, who you know, who didn't show up, and and uh, who was born, and all that kind of stuff. But people really tune into this. I mean, there's a significant segment of society that just loves the depth of understanding of what these animals' lives are like, and uh, and how they how they kind of are, are uh, related to each other and how they interact with one relate with one another. We also have an opportunity to explain the the the, the social hierarchy of the, the bear population at Brooks and how they distribute themselves across the landscape and the importance of the having that access to uh, to the fishing resources they need for putting on winter fat. So uh, this is a free uh, a free tool that people have consumed and taken it upon themselves. I got people that have never been to the park that know cat my bears uh, way better than I do. That's for sure. So uh, we we led to this. Uh, I imagine some folks know know what the fat bear competition is. Uh, it's been it's been growing. It has grown way beyond any expectation that we ever had. At, at this point, I mean, we have we do over a hundred interviews a year uh, at, the, at this time of year uh, with, with, with different news outlets from around the world. I mean, it is just, it's, this is what we're doing for those two weeks or for that week and, and the week prior. Um, we've established a friends group, the Katmai Conservancy, um, and it's, it's helped to generate uh, revenue for, for the park. We do a fundraiser associated with the Fat Bear Week. We, 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 we have identified needs for the funds that we're trying to raise. For infrastructure we can't afford otherwise, for our education and outreach, for for cultural collaboration, and uh, and those kinds of things, and and for for facilitating consultation and and, and co management kinds of conversations that were otherwise difficult. It's hard to have those kinds kinds of conversations on the phone when you really want to dig deep into a particular issue. It's better to get everybody together, and it's hard on a park service budget to pull everybody together. Can't afford it, but. This is the kind of money I can use to, to kind of make those types of moments happen. And you can spend two or three days and talk over a lot of sensitive issues and make some progress. And this is what's making it possible. This, this silly little e event that has grown into something that's phenomenal. And it's also, by the way, a, a remarkable opportunity to, to raise awareness and to gain, to gain uh, support for, for the conservation purpose that your park has. I mean, I, we have millions and millions of fans. If something's going wrong in Katmai National Park, you know, the secretary is going to hear about it. And, uh, and we, hey, it's not, I didn't do anything. You know, it's, uh, it's those folks that fell in love with the park and they're just doing their thing. We've also, we also spend a lot of time uh, doing things that are a little bit uh, unique, perhaps. 
Uh, we, we have learned how to make a social media production and we try to do it well and try to have fun, try to try to make people laugh and laugh ourselves. Uh, we got so good at it. I shouldn't say we, this is mostly not me. They do like two interviews with me a year. Uh, so it's mostly my staff that do this. Uh, the park won a, won a Webby. That's like an Emmy and on, on the online thing. That's incredible. That's a, that's a, that's a Webby. That's like a big deal in the, in the online world. I had no idea, but uh, they gave us one. Um, <clears throat> another thing uh, that I guess has been challenging us with the uh, increased visitation and, uh, and the types of user groups before it was primarily anglers that would go into the river. And now we have anglers and we have what they, what they uh, call river walkers, people that just want to go and kind of walk in the river and, and, and get near the bears and also photographers that kind of use the, the river differently. It's been a challenge for us. It has been a challenge uh, to, uh, to kind of manage all the different increased use while at the same time trying to maintain access by bears uh, for, for the food resources they need. Um, you know, again, I mentioned earlier in this talk, you can't, uh, you can't approach a bear within 50 yards, but a bear can approach you. So you're not violating any reg in the park if a bear walks up to you. But you, you, if a bear does walk up to you, you got to give it 50 yards at the next opportunity. You can hold your ground while a situation passes, but at some point, it's you that needs to move. You can't hold on to your water. The other thing is, is you can't, uh, you can't fish, in, fish within 50 yards of a bear. Last thing we need is to have bears learning how to get fish off of hooks, which, uh, which we, we do have. I mean, it's a, it's a real thing. I, I mean, if that happens and that becomes a, like, the, like the cottonwood situation, and all of a sudden where we got one, now we got two, now we got four, it, it'll be a real problem. And, and how, do we, how do we turn that around? So our way of turning it around is not letting it happen. We are jerks about it. Uh, if you're if you're kind of playing with a fish and letting the bear kind of go after it, you're gonna you're gonna be hearing from us and getting every citation we can cite you on it. Um, but we have had to come up with a uh, the the Brooks River corridor permit system, which has been somewhat controversial. You know, I used to fish here. I've been fishing here for 50 years or 30 years, and and uh, have never had to do this. And now you got you tell me I need a permit. Well, yeah, you do. It's just it's the world's different. You, it's it's. Back 30 years ago, there were 25 bears in the river. In the river, now we got 65. And back 30 years ago, there were, you know, 20 anglers, and now we got 60. So the situation is just different. And so we're trying to uh, to come up with a way. The, the the process has been really good, but it has been a, a learning thing. It, it it gives us an option to raise awareness about what the regulations are, and we we're seeing a much improved compliance because just people before they just didn't know. They didn't even know to to go look to know. Now we have something we can contact them with, and if they insist on just misbehaving, we can pull their permit and kick them out, and that's a game changer too. Uh, sorry about that. So just a couple other things that I just wanted to highlight about the park in general, but uh, Brooks Camp in particular is uh, wildfire is changing its behavior in, in our part of the state like it, like it has in so many other things. This is new to us. We had an 11,000-acre wildfire in the, the southern western part of the state. And uh, that's probably not very much of a fire here in Colorado, but it's a big one in Katmai, and it's an indication of how the system is changing. That was the first time last year. We had a lot of beetle kill. That, that's somewhat of a recent development, too. It happened about 10 years ago. We're trying to develop some defensible space around our buildings and roads and such so that we can continue to operate uh, should we get that wildfire after it happens. Uh, that, this road I mentioned earlier, uh, that's, this is not a river or a stream or anything. That's the road to the valley of 10,000 smokes, which is the image, the, the image on the right. Um, the, the, the valley of 10,000 smokes is the, 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 the remnants of the Nova Rupta eruption, which happened in 1912 and was, by the way, the reason why the park was established in the first place. Uh, this road, this water on the road is really tricky. And so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do about maintaining access to the valley, which is one of the primary geologic resources. That's a fantastic resource, by the way. Uh, the last couple of things I just wanted to mention, uh, changing gears a little bit, is uh, kind of in line with uh, a lot of the talks that I've been hearing uh, today and, uh, and, and all, all week. The National Park Service has been thinking about scaling up collaborative approaches to, uh, to large landscape conservation. This is a publication, I believe, from 2014 about uh, work that's ongoing in various national parks around the country. You'll see down in the lower left on the image on the right that uh, Katmai is not represented there, but we're up to a lot of the same types of work that uh, that this this production uh, alludes to. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that uh, you know this is another 
concept that's out there. It's being worked on by a lot of people. There's a lot of fans. The Buffalo Commons, uh, let's bring back the North American bison, the Plains bison, to a big chunk of its former range. There's an opportunity that includes part of Colorado, uh, and it's something that uh, certainly warrants some close close consideration and support. You know, the, the ecosystem had evolved to uh, to support massive populations of bison and all that that entails. The bison ecology would just be a remarkable thing to see at scale again. And I'll just read the, 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 the language I, I wrote here at the bottom. You know, large landscape conservation is evolving and it's important to pursue every such opportunity wherever it exists. Uh, novel approaches towards conservation, including mutualism, should be pursued in coordinated fashion wherever doing so enhances the opportunities for success. Economics, ecosystem services, tourism, evolution, as well as the capacity for resiliency and adaptation at scale in the face of climate change are just a few reasons why we should continue to strive to achieve large-scale landscape conservation. Places like Brooks Camp within Katmai National Park demonstrate that nature can adapt to us and that individual animals can come to represent and foster support for entire systems that are functioning at a far greater scale. And I'll just end with a few slides. It truly is a privilege to see it come together every year. I mean, it just the whole season, you know, I have the privilege of seeing it, uh, you know, April, May, June, July, August, September. And then uh, to see all the characters and their behaviors and, and what they do and uh, just the spectacular uh, opportunities that, that that this presents, we have uh, we have watchers that that have are endeared to individuals in the image that you see in front of us, and and they 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 are inclined. There's actually been a number of uh, research that we've been conducting about whether or not they're more motivated to support and and contribute to the conservation of Katmai National Park because they know and 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 understand the individual habits and experience life experiences of of individual animals in, in our population. And 70% of the respondents say, yes, they are. That this is financially something that they would invest more in because they know these animals in, you know, intimately. And that's my presentation. So thank you all very much for your time tonight. Hey, we have time for a question or two if you are have any questions about about Brooks? Like, can you go right now? There. Yeah, right here. Hi, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, could you talk a little bit about how these bears interact with each other? Because I'm I'm used to thinking of bears as lone individuals or like a mom and two cubs at at most. So yeah. clearly they're learning from each other. They are. Uh, it's it's a unique situation. That's a great question. Uh, bears are solitary individuals. They normally don't get together unless they're a family, you know, a sow raising cubs or or during breeding season. Otherwise, they're kind of off doing their own thing. Uh, they tolerate each other. There is a pecking order to things, and, and they kind of know where the boundaries are. I mean, down to the foot, you know. I can go up to here, but if I go there, uh, that big guy's going to come over here and give me what for. And it's remarkable to watch. Um, but they they tolerate each other's close proximity at that kind of imagery that you just saw. I'll go back to it. Uh, because of the abundance of food that they can benefit from. Uh, and and so the, the folks that are that are downstream from where the, the action is, uh, picking up the scraps and they're also waiting for the opportunity to move forward because the big guy's full that sort of thing so it's, it's a unique situation and if you want to know more there's a lot of information on the park's website and uh, i'm sure someone at the park if you really want to dig into it can talk to you we've got some really great biologists yeah there's questions in the back there i can <laughs> yeah. Say that again. It, so, it, it, a great question. Uh, we uh, we we tie the the competition with the revenue. Essentially, it's a donation. We're asking for donations. Say, hey, support the park. We're, we 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 essentially identify here's a bunch of expenditures that we'd like to earn some money to. To, uh, to to conduct that work. So we tell people what we're gonna spend the money on. We set, we try to set a goal. 
you know, last year, for example, our, our revenue that we raised during Fat Bear Week was $374,000, which is a lot of money for Katmai National Park, I'll tell you what. Um, the, uh, you know, the first couple of years we did it, we were raising 20 and 30,000. Uh, but but as the Fat Bear Week has grown, last few years, we've really raised some significant funds and we, we, we're not even organized yet. So it's a donation campaign. The other way that we've been raising money is through the popularity of Fat Bear Week. We have our friends group. I've learned an awful lot about trademark law, by the way. All of a sudden, Fat Bear Week is, is something that we need, you know, it's, it's got value and, and there's a lot of people that want to take advantage of that. So we're protecting it like, like it's ours and it is ours. We own that trademark and uh, we sell the products along that line and it's a good thing. It, it, it raises, you know, probably $200,000 a year for the, for the friends group. They, they essentially pay for all their staff time out of that money and then give the balance to us. So it's it's over four hundred thousand that they're raising at this time, and we're hoping it continues to climb. You know, there's a real opportunity there. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you work with the tribes. Can you guys hear me all right? I can hear you. Yep. Okay. You mentioned that you work with the tribes uh, partly because of the building that had been done before. There was some consultation, I'm assuming. So I kind of want to ask, how frequently do you engage with your tribal partners? Yeah. Um, well, st statutorily, I, I'm, I'm obligated to engage with them once a year. We're doing a lot more than that. Uh, I'll, I'll even go a, a bit further. Uh, the Katmai has, uh, I guess, uh, stepped on its own toe a few times. We have, we have done the wrong thing and really offended some people. We're trying to not do that anymore. And so we, and finally, you know, after a while of, uh, understandably uh, not wanting to work, you know, tribes not wanting to work with the park. We're kind of into a phase now where we're earning some trust and we're trying to show through, you know, we've, we did this thing we said we would do now let's do this other bigger thing. And we're, we're getting to the point where we're actually doing the really big good things to do. So we're probably just to answer your question. Uh, I'm probably in touch with tribal counterparts there just so that everyone understands there's over 40 affiliated tribes with Katmai national park and preserve. It's a lot. And uh, so uh, weekly, I'm in touch with somebody, but really the substantive uh, consultation, you know, what are we going to do about this thing that we're working on together? Probably monthly, I'm in touch with uh, tribal partners in that way, myself or my staff. And I'd be happy to talk more at length about some of the specifics of that, if you'd like. Yeah. All right. Can you hear me? I can. Yep. Oh, green button. Got you. <laughs> Um, to go on the first question, since these bears are more solitary, except for when there is, you know, the salmon runs, do they work together to, you know, get a large, like to move the salmon into more ideal situations? Or is it just kind of, you know, they pop up and fly in their mouths? So, uh, sows teach their cubs how to catch. There's a sow and a cub here at the top of the falls uh, and sh she will wait and and you know you go ahead and have the prime spot kind of thing and then she'll move in you know that cub will stand there for 45 minutes driving the sow nuts you know the sow finally you know he gives up or or or, or goes away uh, and the sow will show back up and within you know two minutes she has her fish um so it's a it, there's there's that type of teaching that goes on do they work together in collusion to fish i don't think they do uh but my biologist would be the right person to ask um, they certainly, uh, they certainly fish near each other and like the buddies will hang out and they'll, they'll be doing the same thing, but they're not like coordinated trying to get that one fish. It's remarkable though, the different techniques that individual bears develop. I mean, it's, it is remarkable the diversity of ways bears catch fish and they figure it out and, uh, and it's, yeah, you got to come and see it. I wonder um, to what extent do you think the mutualism and the popularity and the fundraising potential that you just talked about are unique to Katmai and its resources and its location or possible in other parks and places? Yeah. Uh, so this is unique, no doubt, right? Uh, we have a cast of characters, there's villains and there's, 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 there's heroes and, and there's, uh, there's, damsels in distress and all that kind of stuff going on in front of us here. And, uh, 
and 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 we we know a lot of that story we don't know it all we, we you know we're not there to see everything but we know a lot of it and and people understand it so and they all come back to this spot that's that's the unique thing this is like right here we can put a camera and sh and, and keep telling this story and, and the story is going to keep telling itself um are there opportunities to tell similar stories i think that there are quite honestly uh depending on the scale you know i guess i just was talking with someone yesterday about the meerkat manor uh you know the program that went on for years that was a few years ago that was a, a i followed that thing i just like that kind of uh that, that type of detailed knowledge about particular animals and their life life stories uh there's certainly opportunities to tell those types of stories elsewhere are there areas like this elsewhere in the world i can't i can't imagine that there's not uh, do they exist in in uh in various states around the country uh, i think we would just need to think about how could we apply this type of a model to the wildlife that occurs in various uh, various states around the country um, it might be that you need to follow the animal because the animals don't, you know, they do their thing in various locations. Uh, but but one thing I guess I, I would leave you with the impression of is sharing what you do know in a kind of a, a digestible, publicly digestible manner is kind of, I think, the foundation that kind of helped get this thing to where it is. You know, we 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 got our books. They've been sitting on shelves for a while. We've just produced a publication. Says, hey, anybody interested in reading about our bears? And sure enough, there was a bunch of them. So putting that information out there free is a good way to start getting interest. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering about, sorry, over here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yep. I was just wondering about the uh, permitting situation and the tribal nations that are affiliated with the park. Yeah. Uh, members of those nations, are they exempt from the permitting or are they uh, bound by the permitting legislation as well? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So that permit system that I mentioned, uh, is uh, only for the Brooks River. There's a lot of layers to the question you just asked, but the short answer is we actually explicitly exempt them from uh, from having to acquire the permit. They actually have a, a, a law that, that requires us to allow them to come and collect uh, redfish, which is essentially the sockeye salmon at the red phase. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's codified in law and, and we certainly uh, uh, support it. Uh, but uh, we also explicitly don't require them to access uh, access the river with the permit. They have the, they have the traditional access rights, and we we honor that. Yeah. Great presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm interested in whether or not you have info on what <clears throat> the average trip cost is for someone who comes out there, and it's not just because I need to start saving money, <laughs> but that I'm interested in, and in also if you've come up with any methods for allowing folks who are economically disadvantaged to take advantage of the opportunity aside from the webcam, which is awesome. So uh, it's not it's not inexpensive. It is, it is costly. Uh, you gotta get to Anchorage. And then from Anchorage, it's $600 round trip to King Salmon, if, if you're coming through King Salmon, which most people do. And then it's another, $400 into the park. And that's just to get you to Brooks camp. If you're going out to the coast, you got to charter a flight. So, I mean, it, it, it's a costly thing. I would say, find your friends, everybody comes and we, you, you get, uh, you get your, your campsite. If you want to stay in the lodge, you know, that's a, that's an $800 a night cabin. And, and so it's, it's a costly endeavor that, that infrastructure where it is, is it's a lot to get there and it's a lot to maintain where it is. So it's a, uh, there's a reason why it costs so much. Um, but there are ways to do it inexpensively. Uh, you can you can do backcountry camping. You can just you, you know, essentially you can't camp within a mile and a half of Brooks Falls here. You, I, you know, I guess uh, we prohibit that. But you could hike a mile and a half out into the backcountry. Uh, talk to talk to me or somebody that knows how to camp in backcountry and bear country, uh, and uh, get yourself all the gear you need. And then you can you can do it on the cheap. You just got to get there. Um, the other thing that you question is is something we're actually doing uh, with with affiliated peoples. We're trying to bring uh, uh, affiliated youth uh, back to Katmai village and other villages that had to be abandoned after the eruption, the Inovarupt eruption in 1912, with some of the funds that we're raising. So at least locally, regionally, with people with close ties to Katmai lands, uh, we're, we're actually doing that. They would otherwise never be able to get to where we're taking them. Um, and I would hope as we fulfill that workload, which is a big workload, it's going to take us a while, that perhaps we could create similar types of opportunities for underserved communities uh, in, in Alaska and beyond. I mean, the, the, if, we've, if we've done all we can locally, let's go bigger. There's, there's, there's no end to it. 
Hi, I'm just wondering if you're monitoring the food availability and then practicing any sort of dynamic management with regards to your visitors in years of low food availability. So if, if we're monitoring food availability, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so thankfully, uh, again, it's an abundant and remarkably productive system. Lots of fish uh, and, uh, and, and they show up on time. There was uh, one summer, 2018, when uh, that, that big red blob heat spell was continued. It, it didn't end in 2016 like the slide did. It, it went on for a couple more years. And the water temperature in the river got so high that the, all the salmon left. They went out into the deeper waters in the lake. And the bears were all around saying, well, what do we do now? You know, and so they all headed to the higher ground where it was cooler and started eating berries. Thankfully, it was a decent berry year. Um, but there is there is concern about uh, if, if that kind of a phenomenon recurs and and sustains for any length of time. Uh, what what is that going to do to us? I guess we uh, uh, we're we're watching and learning about the system as best we can. Thankfully, uh, the bears again are adaptable, and uh, what they did in that one instance that I've seen, they moved out for a couple of weeks and came back when the fish when the dr temperature dropped and the fish came back in. So her question triggered another in my mind about indigenous access to these mm -hmm. lands. People don't, or I'm sorry, bears don't distinguish between visitors and indigenous peoples. So no. are the, the indigenous folks that historically have used these lands, are they regulated by the same access rules that you use in the park to manage visitors? And, um, and how does that are they resentful of that? Are they partners with you in coordinating what it looks like to regulate human access to these lands? I'm just curious what that dynamic yeah. looks like. Uh, locally at Brooks Camp, uh, I guess we don't have that particular issue. Uh, access is is certainly not not something that uh, is a concern for us, and nor is it an issue with the, the the tribal counterparts that I interact at Brooks Camp. There are resource access issues elsewhere in Again, it's a four million acre park with lots of resources beyond Brooks Camp, uh, and and we are uh, trying to uh, work with tribes uh, to uh, to uh, there, there's a, there's a couple of things I can share. Uh, we have had a request from a couple of uh, affil affiliated communities that have a historical tie to the northern parts of the park where the preserve is uh, for c cultural and traditional access. Uh, using using me mechanisms, essentially ATVs, to access various areas where they could then uh, access uh, subsistence resources. Uh, subsistence is a type of, of natural resource uh, utilization that is actually codified or, or authorized in, in a law up in Alaska called the NILCA, uh, and, and, and the, the state and the federal government need to provide subsistence resources to uh, qualifying uh, communities uh, before any sport hunting activities can occur. And so uh, we have a couple of uh, requests for consideration for uh, traditional and customary access to be able to access, uh, in this case, uh, areas of the preserve where, where individuals from those communities could could uh, take advantage of caribou and moose primarily that occur in that part of the, the preserve. Um, there's also, uh, uh, a, a, I guess, a, an issue uh, on the on the western side of the park where we have been talking with uh, affiliated tr affiliated tribal members about the the need for food security to access uh, to access subsistence resources, it's in an area of the park where subsistence use is currently prohibited uh, because it's a it's, it was dedicated under ANILCA as as National Park Service non qualifying subsistence lands, and uh, we have a request before Congress to maybe rethink about that, you know, to reconsider that decision and perhaps allow for some level of subsistence use in that part of the park. The National Park Service supports it, the community supports it. Uh, we would welcome any advocacy on, on their behalf to gain that access and gain access to those resources, which are, you know, it is it is tough times. Inflation's hitting up there. I mean, things cost a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's expensive here. It's a lot more expensive up there. And uh, if, if, uh, if they can't get access to uh, moose and caribou, which are at, at levels of abundance that aren't cause for conservation concern, and they can be utilized certainly for subsistence purposes, uh, we, we should be trying to support that, especially for uh, native affiliated peoples.
more. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, that's it. Actually, I'm instructed to tell you that they're closing down in two minutes. No, eight o'clock, we'll, we'll be calling it quits here. And of course, we want you back at eight in the morning. So that's one of the reasons we're saying eight tonight. So thanks. I hope you had a terrific day and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>